The culture does not speak Bible. The culture does not speak Christian. The world does not understand the language that we use. While we're preparing to receive a word from the Lord, would you once again turn in your Bibles or in your smart devices to the Gospel of John? We have been listening to the Lord from the pages of the fourth evangelist for this entire month, yea, even this season of Lent. And today I want to invite you once again into that fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. I'm going to invite you in your devotional time this week to read the entirety of the third chapter. But for the sake of preaching this morning, I want to abbreviate and just read the first eight verses of John chapter 3. When you found the third chapter of John, if you're physically able, won't you stand that together we might reverence the reading of the Word of God from John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1, I'm reading out of the New King James Version of God's Holy Word. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Do me a favor, before you sit down, I need you to play old school Baptist preacher for a little bit. Find someone who doesn't look like they mind you looking back at them. And give them today's sermon title. Tell them, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. You, must be you must be born again. Born again. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You must be born again. One of my favorite Christian writers is a professor of New Testament who recently passed away. His name is Marcus Borg, B-O-R-G. Marcus Borg is highly regarded as one of the most progressive scholars and voices of Christianity. He's written many books worth reading. One of my favorites is a book released in 2011, simply entitled, Speaking Christian. In Speaking Christian, Marcus Borg suggests that you and I, our experience of God is shaped by the language we use in describing God to one another and speaking about God to others. He argues in a real sense that the Christianity has its own language. Words and terms that have been passed down from generation to generation and most often have their rooting in Bible. We speak biblical ease, Christian ease, language that is familiar to us. We Use words like resurrection, redemption, repentance, ascension, salvation, trinity, sin. And he argues that those words are uniquely Christian and the difficulty is that we now live in the midst of a culture and a context that is unchristian. Or in the words of Otis Moss III, post-soul. That more often than not, you encounter people who have not been raised in church. 
whose parents did not push Sunday school on them. They were not raised to speak Bible. And therefore, when we use Christian language with an unchristian culture, they have no clue what you're talking about. And he says the problem is that those outside of church don't understand the language we use inside of church and we're trying to persuade a generation that doesn't know Bible to come to Jesus using language they're unfamiliar with. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been frustrated with autocorrect on your phone? Have you ever been texting someone and your phone thought it knew better than you what you were trying to say? This morning I was joking with a friend and texting and telling her she's a sinner and needs to go to church. And every time I typed the word sinner, my iPhone changed it to dinner. <laughs> because Apple does not like the word sinner. Apple doesn't understand Christian language. Apple does not think I'm trying to speak Bible because Apple believes I'm trying to speak to the culture and the culture does not speak Bible. The culture does not speak Christian. The world does not understand the language that we use. And Borg argues that it is hard to draw people to Jesus when you're using language they don't understand. He said, but the deeper problem is not only that the world doesn't understand our language, but Borg argues, stay with me, that in the church, the way we use Christian language is not authentic to how it's actually used in the Bible. That we use words and terms in ways that don't match how they were originally used in scripture. In a real sense, not only does the world not know what we're talking about, but you don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> that we have a temptation to use words out of context, even in our Christian culture. An example, Paul uses the word righteousness. And when we use righteousness, we think of it as a list of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But Paul, when Paul uses righteousness, he's not speaking about action, he's speaking about relationship. And Paul's use of righteousness is not a list of what you do and a list of what you don't do. Paul's righteousness is about being in relationship with God and God dwelling in your mind and God dwelling in your heart and God dwelling in your spirit. And when you use righteousness, you use it incorrectly. If I thoroughly lost you, a good example of Christian language is exemplified right here in John chapter 3. You will recall that John writes his gospel focusing on interactions that cause us to question what we believe and who we believe in. And in this third chapter of John, the question of belief is raised in an interaction Jesus has with a brother named Nicodemus. Let the church say Nicodemus. In case you've never met Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the Jews. And not only is he a Pharisee, but Nicodemus has a seat on the Sanhedrin council. The Sanhedrin Council is the governing body of the Jews, the 72 Jewish leaders who are elevated to the highest realm where they litigate and debate the laws of Moses and they hear the cases of Israel. These are the elite teachers of the law. This is the group that will ultimately lead the charge to convict Jesus and crucify him on the cross. And Nicodemus is a member of the Sanhedrin Council. And much to our surprise, Nicodemus is a believer in Jesus Christ. We're introduced to him in John 3 
but you'll meet him two more times. He shows up when the Sanhedrin council is meeting and they want to crucify Jesus. And Nicodemus says, you shouldn't crucify a man without first giving him a chance to prove himself. And then after Jesus has died, it is Nicodemus who goes to Pilate and asks for the right to take the body of Jesus off of the cross. Nicodemus is a believer in Jesus. And he comes to Jesus in the third chapter. And before we applaud him too much, please note that Nicodemus, the Bible says, comes to Jesus at night. He's a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. He believes in Jesus at night. He shows up when he can't be seen. He believes when it's safe. He follows when it's convenient. He doesn't mind confessing Jesus as long as nobody else knows about it. Beloved, I raised Nicodemus for you because I got a funny feeling <laughs> and a sneaky suspicion that you might know some Nicodemus. Matter of fact, I bet there's a Nicodemus on your pew. Matter of fact, I bet there may be a Nicodemus in your seat. Because we all know of somebody who believes in the Lord as long as it's safe. Doesn't mind following as long as it costs me nothing. When was the last time being a disciple cost you something? Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He says, Jesus, we know you're a teacher sent from God because can't nobody do what you do unless God is with him. Jesus turns back to Nicodemus and says this, Nick, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Jesus uses the phrase born again and Nicodemus, like the world today and like the church today, has no clue what Jesus is talking about. Born again? Born again? Marcus Borg argues that born again is some of that Christian language that the world doesn't understand, and I'm willing to bet some folk in church don't even understand. When you hear the word born again, I bet you think of Pentecostal sanctified folk. When you hear born again, I bet you think of talking in tongues. When you hear born again, I bet you envision Somebody coming to the altar and a preacher laying hands on them and they fall out and they bring a little blanket and put over them and then the mother's board with them white outfits and the pantyhose you can't even see through come up and they begin fanning people. Born again. Born again is not language we're comfortable with. But yet Jesus says, you must be born again. Born again is not comfortable for us. As a matter of fact, let me prove it to you. A recent survey gathered together individuals who identified themselves as Christian. They gathered together a group of people who claimed that they were Christian and gave them a survey to ask them to check which terms they would use to identify themselves as Christian. Let me share with you the result. In a group that identified as Christian, 86% identified themselves as members of a church. They were comfortable saying they went to church. 71% were comfortable saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Everyone who is Christian was not comfortable saying Jesus is Lord and Savior. 63% said that they were saved. 
100% a Christian, only 63 said that they're comfortable saying they're saved. Only 49% called themselves disciples of Jesus. Only 41% were comfortable saying they're redeemed. And what ought to shock you is that only 23% identified themselves as born again. 100% Christian, but three out of four Christians are uncomfortable saying that they are born again. We are uncomfortable with the term born again, but yet Jesus says you must be born again. How can you be a Christian and not be confident that you're born again? We don't understand what that means. What does it mean to be born again? And the goal of this sermon is real simple, sister. Brother, let me break it down. When you leave today, I want you confident in sharing with the world, not just that you're Christian, and not just that you go to Alfred Street Baptist Church, and not just that you have a Bible, and not just that you can sing Amazing Grace. I want you to be able to leave church today and look anybody you meet eyeball to eyeball and let them know I am a born again believer in Jesus Christ. I'm born again. I'm born again. I'm born again. The difficulty with born again, why the world doesn't understand it, and why even Nicodemus is confused, is because of the phrase Jesus uses. You, you don't see it in English, but it's there in Greek. And the problem is that in the original language in which it's written, it's somewhat confusing. And so your English translator tries to make it simple. Let me teach Bible. When Jesus looks at Nicodemus and speaks to us, it says you must be born again. The Greek term he uses is gneo anothen. Gneo anothen. Say it with me. Gneo anothen. Let's try it again. Gneo anothen. One more time for the Holy Spirit. Gneo. Anothen. The word gneo is the verb to be born. That's not where the controversy is. The controversy is in the word anothen. And the controversy is that anothen, Barbara, can be translated in three ways. There are three translations for anothen. And your Bible translator, New International, New King James, King James, New Revised Standard, makes a decision for you of which one of those three to share. So when you read in your English Bible, someone has chosen for you which of the three. And because they chose, you're not exposed to the other two. So today at Alfred Street, in this sermon, we're going to look at what the three translations of Anothen are because in those three translations, you begin to understand what it means to be born again. Can we teach Bible? What does it mean to be born again? It means that we need to understand the translations of Anothen. The first translation of Anothen is literally the word again. Now, this may be deep, but to be born again, to be Ganeo Anothen, to be born again means to be born again. <laughs> that the first translation of Anothen is again. Let the church say again. Again, again implies another opportunity. Again implies that I get to try it again. The reason Nicodemus doesn't understand Jesus is because Nicodemus knows there's no way in the flesh for someone to be born of a woman and go back in her womb and be born again. In Nicodemus' mind, there's some things, once they're done, you can never do them again. 
There's some things, once they're finished, you never get another shot at it. There's some things that are final and can never be undone and give you another opportunity to do it again. And Jesus uses the word anothen to let Nicodemus know that's the way it is in the flesh, but that's not the way it is with God. That God is so much God that what you thought you could only do once, God is able to give you another opportunity to do again what you never thought you could do again. I feel like preaching right here that God gives us another chance. Here's the shout that what you thought would only happen once, God lets you try again. When you messed up, and you thought that was the end, God gave you again. When you dropped the ball and thought that was the last time, God gave you again. As a matter of fact, there's somebody walking in again, living in again, trying again. We serve a God who gives us a chance after chance after chance after chance. Somebody holler again. Yeah. Here it is. To be born again means that I recognize, catch this, my last time wasn't my last time. Yeah. That, that my mistakes are not the end of me. My failures are not fatal. That no matter how much I mess up in God, God gives me again. Now, so that you understand why that means you're born again, because the only way God gives you again is because on the cross, when Jesus died, all of your sins, all of your mistakes, all of your faults, all of your ratchetness was nailed to the cross and paid for by the death of Jesus Christ. So the only way I get again is that I know that when Jesus died and said it is finished, he wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about my mistakes. They are finished and paid for and covered in the blood of Jesus. What does it mean to be born again? It means that I accept what God offers in Jesus again another chance that no matter how much I mess up God gives me another chance okay some of y'all ain't excited about it um, let, let me see if I can break it down um, I need your prayers and I really I, re I really solicit this I'm serious I need your prayers because um, I'm raising two teenage boys um, and to teen teenage teenage You, you ever want to kill your offspring? Um, teen, teen, anybody raised teenagers? Anybody been through teenage thing? Oh, um, and my oldest, with his 15-year-old self, um, he, he, he doesn't like talking to me anymore. Um, when, when, I, when I talk to him, he acts like I'm getting on his nerves. Right? He's short with me. One word answers, attitude. No. I pay the bills. And I'm getting on your nerves. I, I, y'all, y'all pray for me because um, he may not make it to 16. Um, his favorite hobby, I kid you not, is going to his room and closing the door. And, and there and the other day, I went up there, he, he had locked the door. Now, y'all are new school, but I, you, you don't lock no door in my house. <laughs> I, I, my, this, this ain't right. He came home, I had taken the door off the hinges. Because <laughs> guess what? You can't lock a door if you ain't got one. Hey. 
you know, he, he goes upstairs, he wants to get away from me, and you know, he, he goes and plays on Xbox with his friends. That's all he likes to do, is play on Xbox with his friends. And so, you know, I'm trying to get some father-son time. I've been out of town, and I wanted to spend some time with my son, so I went upstairs, and I walked in his room, because there wasn't no door to knock on, you know. Um, <laughs> walked in his room, I said, come on, man, let, let's, let's play Xbox together. I want to I wanna play, and he acted like, like I was getting on his nerves, asking to play on X. I bought the Xbox. <laughs> I bought the house. Hey, hey, you, you living under my roof. So, so I said, listen, get off with your friends. You're going to play with your dad. And he got attitude and put on his favorite game, this game called Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Now, now he acted like I'm aggravating him because I'm asking him to teach me how to play the game. I bought the game. I bought the Xbox. I bought the house. <laughs> so I said, listen, teach me how to play the game. So he puts the game on. And you, if you never played it, it's this first-person shooter uh, where you are thrown in a combat scene. And the very first scene I'm in, I've got to navigate through a minefield. And, and, and the way to start the game is you've got to navigate through the minefield and not step on the landmines. So I'm navigating through the line, minefield, and I stepped on the landmine, and my character died. I thought that was the end of the game. I'm giving him the controller. He said, Dad, hold on. You're going to respawn. Now, now, you don't know what that is, but your kids do. R-E-S-P-A-W-N. Let me tell you what respawn means. Respawn means that when your character has died, uh, the game will bring them back to life. And, and so I stepped on a landmine, I died, and then my character came back. And I kept navigating, and I stepped on another landmine, and I died, and then the character came back. And I stepped on another landmine, and I died, and the character came back. And, and I stepped on another landmine, and I died, and the character came back. Can I tell you about the God we serve, that he is able to bring us back after every mistake we've made? I, I kept coming back, and I finally looked at him and said, son, how many times will I come back? He said, Dad, you're going to keep coming back until you figure out how to get through the minefield. That I'm going to keep bringing you back and back and back and back until you get this thing right. Is there anybody here who knows about a God that gave you chance after chance after chance? Somebody holler again! To be born again means that I accept that in Jesus, God gives me another chance. You ain't got to run around the church. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to pass out at the altar. You just have to say yes to God's again. I feel like preaching. Uh, born again doesn't just mean, uh, again, a nothing also means a new. So one way to translate it is you must be born anew. Now, now I don't want to take too much time on this, and I hope this doesn't confuse you, but anew seems to indicate that something ain't what it used to be. That anew implies some change. That when you compare what it is to what it used to be, it's not the same. And what Jesus says, listen, this, this is what I want. In order to see the kingdom of God, not only must you be born again and accept that God gives you another chance. He said, but you have to realize that your life is being changed. Listen, you know how you can tell you're born again and how you're born anew? Not by how loud you shout. As a matter of fact, I'm going to suggest to you that being born anew is not proven in church. Anybody can act holy for 90 minutes. Of course you look sanctified on Sunday. You got a Bible in your hand, the camera's on you, you just got to act like you know Jesus. <laughs> Being born anew means that there are moments when I look at myself and I look at where I am now and what I used to be and I can declare without a shadow of a doubt 
and without fear of contradiction. I am not what I used to be. I don't do what I used to do. I don't live the way I used to live. I don't run where I used to run. I don't hang with who I used to hang with. Is there anybody on a Sunday morning who can declare my life has been changed? You know how you've been born anew? When you look at yourself on Friday night and there's some stuff you don't even think about doing no more because you don't have it in you to do what you used to do because the Lord has changed you. The Lord has brought you too far. The Lord has done too much. God has changed me. Somebody say change. change. Now, I need you to know the change is not simply what it means to be born anew. To be born anew means to understand why I changed. Let me help you real quick. I've, I've lived long enough now, at almost 50 years of life, to tell you, um, you can't change nobody. People have to want to change, uh, but, but you, you can't change nobody. No, nobody. And that, that's why you get frustrated because you think the more you love them, the kinder you are, the, that they're going to change. No, no, you can't change. As a matter of fact, every married person in here ought to yell amen. If you married, amen. You can't change nobody. People have to want to change. So the question at the heart of this what makes somebody want to change? Let me tell you this. Most people only want to change when they feel the heat. Most people only want to change when they realize that what they're doing ain't working and it costs too much to keep doing it. Most people only want to change when the punishment and the penalty caught up with them. Most people only want to change when the fire gets too hot and they realize, I can't keep living like this. Now, 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 if that's your motivation for change, that's good. Because if what you're doing ain't working, you ought to change. If what you're doing is hurting the people you love, you ought to change. If what you're doing is costing you too much, you ought to want to change. But born anew is a different kind of change. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Born anew is the change that says, I'm not changing my life because I got caught. I'm not changing my life because it's hurting me. I'm not changing my life because it's hurting you. That to be born anew means that I'm changing my life because I realize the way I'm living hurts God. And my motivation is my love for the Lord. You know how you know when you've been born anew? When you wake up one morning, and you realize how good God has been to you. You look around your house and see God has been mighty good to me. The Lord has blessed me. The Lord has walked with me. The Lord has kept me. The Lord has answered prayers. The Lord has made ways. And when I think of how good God has been, I got to get myself together because I can't keep living like this when God's been that good to me. Have you ever changed simply because you love God? To be born anew means I have a God consciousness that convicts me when I'm outside of God's will. That I'm changing not simply because I don't like what I see in the mirror, but I want God to like who he sees in the morning. I want God to look at me and smile. That I'm getting my life together because I love the Lord. Not because I got caught, not because it hurt, not because of the pain. I'm doing it for a deeper reason. Beloved, you know you've been born again when you accept that God gives you again. You know that you've been born anew when your motivation for changing is that you love the Lord. And watch this third one. This one makes me shout, Anothen, again, Anothen, anew. Here's the third one. Anothen means from above. That I am born from above. That something in me 
has been birthed by something higher than me. Something that reached down and touched me. That until that hand reached down and touched me, I realized I was not really living. That I need something up there to come down here in order for me to make it every day. That what I have and who I am is not enough to live this life. But if I can connect with something higher than me and greater than me and stronger than me, that something up there helps me live down here. So watch what Jesus says. I feel like preaching. He says, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of water and spirit. Water and spirit. Water is fleshly birth. It is a direct reference to when a woman's water breaks in preparation for delivery. He says, listen, listen, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of the flesh, but you also need to be born of the spirit. Watch this, because being born of the flesh ain't enough. Flesh is not enough to live. No matter what you get in the flesh, it ain't enough. No matter how much you make, no matter how many degrees you put on the wall, no matter how many followers you get on Twitter, no matter how many folk you are connected to that can get you up in the front of the line and VIP, none of that is enough for you to be alive because what does it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? You are more than flesh. You are more than degrees. You are more than salary. You are more than tax bracket. You are more than area code. You are more than that. You need something from up there to touch you down here. Wish I had a Bible reader right here to remember how our lives were shaped. That when God decided to make your rusty, dusty self, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that God reached down into the dirt. Because you know at the end of the day, you really ain't nothing but dirt. You may be in church, you're just sanctified dirt. You may be dressed up, you're just well-dressed dirt. You may be employed, you're just money-earning dirt. You are just dirt. But when God began to breathe God's spirit into dirt, dirt became alive because we are dependent on the spirit of God to give us strength to live in this life. I'm done, Alfred Street. But you know how you know you've been born again? Not just when you accept that God gives you again. Not just when you know that you're changing because you love the Lord. But you know you've been born again when you recognize my flesh ain't enough. And I need the hand of God to guide me every day. To walk with me and talk with me and hold me. Is there anybody here who knows I need the Lord in my life? God, I need you right now. I need you in this moment. I am nothing without God. Somebody say, I need the Lord. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, Lord, that I'm born again. Not because I talk in tongues. But because I accept that in Jesus, I get again. I'm born again because I know I'm new. I'm changing because I love you. And I'm born again because something from above gives me strength to live down here. So, So let me close with a difficult word. Because when Nicodemus doesn't understand... Jesus breaks it down by talking about the wind. Can I teach Bible? 11.30.08. Um, (laughs) Jesus says, Nicodemus, this born again thing, this born a new thing, this born from above thing, it's like the wind. The wind blows where it wants. You can't control it. You can't command it. All you can do is feel it. Make sure you catch this, saints, because it's going to mess up some folk. This relationship with God thing is like the wind. It blows 
and you can't control it. It goes where it wants to go and you can't tell it not to go over there. The, the wind does not listen to you when the wind wants to go over there. One of the most dangerous false doctrines of the evangelical Christian community is the belief that they control the wind. That we somehow control who's in and who's out. Who's saved and who's going to hell. Uh, can I tell you, you can't control God's love. You can't command salvation. If God wants to blow over there, you can't stop it. If God wants to blow on them, you can't control it. If God wants to save that group, you can't prevent it. We don't control the wind. All we do is feel it. Beloved, salvation is one of those inexplicable joys that we experience. I can't explain it. I can't defend it. I can't put it on paper. But I just feel it. And the best you can do is feel it for yourself. I can't tell you it ain't blowing on you. But I feel it blowing on me. It is an experience not an explanation. There are some things so wonderful about what God does, you can't explain it. You just feel it. You know where this became real for me, CJ? My very first chance I had to bear witness of Jesus Christ to someone. The very first chance I had to really try to lead someone to Jesus Christ happened when I was a freshman in college at Duke. In my freshman year, staying on East Campus at All Spa Dorm, I was rooming with my best friend, and right next door to us was another room, and in that room was an Italian boy named Trevor. Trevor played for the Duke tennis team. We turned out to be good friends. And one Sunday morning, Trevor saw me getting up, going to church. One of the few Sundays I went to church as a freshman. <laughs> I had a lot of homework on Sunday, a Saturday, you know, I, was, I had something to do. So he saw me getting up going to church. When I came back from church, Trevor was still in the dorm, and he paused me in the hallway and says, why do you waste your time going to church? And we sat down, and he began to scientifically try to prove to me that God ain't real. This is his argument. He said, well, you know, you say you believe in God, but can I see God? I said, No. He said, can I touch God? I said, no. Can I measure God? I said, no. Can I smell God? I said, no. He said, well, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, if I can't measure it, if I can't smell it, how do you know it's real? And that thing messed me up. I've been going to Baptist church my whole life at 18 and I couldn't figure out how to witness to him. I know I'm supposed to lead him to Jesus. I'm supposed to share my faith, but he got me. If I can't see it, touch it, measure it, smell it, it must not be real. A few weeks later, the Holy Spirit set me up. Trevor came knocking on my door late one night. I was one of the few freshmen that had a car. He said, man, I need you to take me to the emergency room. I said, Trevor, what's wrong? He says, I have a toothache that's killing me. I got to go to the emergency room. Something is wrong. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Yes, she did. I said, you got a toothache? He said, yes. I said, can I see it? He said, no. I, I said, can I touch it? No. Can I measure it? No, can I smell it? No, I said, well, hold on. If, if, if you got a toothache, but I can't see it, I can't touch it, I can't measure it, I can't smell it, how do I know it's real? This is what he said. He said, because I can feel it. 
How do I know my God is real? How do I know I've been born again? How do I know I've been born anew? How do I know I've been born from above? I can't explain it. I can't touch it. I can't measure it. I can't see it, but I feel it in my heart. Is there anybody in Alfred Street who feels the love of God, feels the salvation of the Lord, feels God working in your life? I know it because I feel it. Come on, stand on your feet. No, somebody tell them, I'm born again. Not because I run around church, not because I speak in tongues, but I accept that God gives me again. I'm changing because I love the Lord and I know that something up there gives me strength to live down here. Beloved, I want you to be born again. It sounds complicated, but it's real easy. All you've got to do is believe. Believe that Christ died for you and that through his death, you can live a better life. It's really that simple. Don't let the devil complicate it and make you think you've got to get your life together first. There's certain things you got to quit. There's certain things you won't change until you say yes. There's certain things you won't be delivered from until you say yes.